Perfect. Awesome. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to learn about our new resource today and enjoy this panel discussion. We're reporting on addiction and this QR code will take you to our website. Just want to start off with a little baseline setting and a reminder that the, the purpose of our project is understanding where journalists are coming from and trying to support journalists in your mission to inform your communities. And we, of course, know that journalists do not want to harm their communities, but your jobs are incredibly, incredibly difficult. You oftentimes have multiple beats, super tight deadlines, and really few resources to do the in-depth reporting that you got into this field to do and have that, have that desire to do to uncover some of these issues and, and help inform your community. And so we know that even with that, um, your work still has a massive impact on your community and on policymakers. And so it's up to journalists and editors to really help improve news coverage about addiction. So a little bit about us and our background. Uh, we launched in 2020, and since then, uh, we officially, I guess we officially launched in 2021, sorry. And we've had an impact in our three main verticals or domains that we work in. We work with professional journalists, and we do that through one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and support. So if you're a journalist on this call or watching the video and you need help sourcing a story, um, finding visuals, any of those things, you reach out to us. We help do all of that. We also do newsroom trainings and we present at news oriented conferences to introduce folks to our resources and webinars like the one that we're doing today. We also work with educators and student journalists, that next generation of journalists that we're always very excited to be working with uh, and helping, helping them along their journey to being professional journalists. We're really excited this summer, we added eight new journalism schools that will be teaching our off the shelf curriculum. So we have a total of 13 schools across the country and we're always growing there. So if you're an educator and you're interested, reach out, we can help uh, train you on our curriculum next summer. We also train student newsrooms and we present at national education conferences for student journalists and educators. And then we work with experts. So this panel today is made up with experts through training and experts through experience and professional journalists. And we help try to support experts in their work with the media. So we wanna provide media training, competency building, and that same technical assistance for folks that are doing interviews so that they can feel comfortable getting this message out to the media. Because one of the hardest things that we heard from professional journalists is like, who can I talk to? And so we really wanna make that accessible and help people feel competent in doing so. And we do that at conferences and that one-on-one -on -one support. To date, we've launched our language style guide. Uh, so the language style guide, you can see a quick picture here. There's a downloadable version at this QR code uh, that is based on the AP press guidelines and has important context, helpful tips for how to report in a way that is consistent with best practices. It also includes some up-to-date research that isn't yet in the Associated Press guidelines to help shape that em empathic and accurate reporting. We have that expert database that I mentioned. So if you're an expert on this call or listening to the video and you're interested in working more with the media um, and want to get your name out there so that we can connect you with media sources, signing up for this database is a wonderful resource. And it's also a great resource for journalists. You can sort it by area, by state, um, by specialty. If there's a story that you're writing on alcohol, for example, you can find really easily experts on alcohol use disorder that can talk about that with you and be a source for your story or help point you to other resources in the space. And then of course, one of the newest resources that we launched this spring is the Opioid Settlement uh, Funds Transparency Project. So we're, we're supporting journalists as they're investigating how the settlement funds are coming into the communities and making the impact that we hope that they are in the communities that you cover. So we have resources uh, that we've compiled for journalists. We do trainings specific to this uh, and the resources that we've created. And then we also do quarterly fireside chats on uh, webinars that we, we pull in experts in the space to talk about resources that can really help you think through both story ideas and become get up to speed really quickly and become aware of what's going on with the opioid settlement funds. I am gonna hand it off to Ashton, our co-founder on this project as they talk about the resource that we have here today. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So today we are celebrating the launch of our newest resource to help journalists in the reporting process. Um, as Jonathan and I have gone out and spoken to experts through experience and experts through training in this space, what we've consistently heard from them is there are some, some journalists who are doing fantastic reporting, they're doing all the right things, everything I could ask of them, and then a photo gets put next to or with that article that makes it really difficult for me to celebrate and share their work with people in my space. So we knew that we needed to do something to help photojournalists, but also journalists who are in small newsrooms 
and are being asked to create or choose this content on their own without much training in the space. So that's where our visual style guide comes in. Much like our language style guide, we have a lot of really similar structures available for journalists so that hopefully you can move through this pretty quickly. Um, and then on our website, we have more detailed kind of uh, reasoning, rationale, more detailed tips for you to use. So we started this process by working with photo journalists. We asked photo journalists to sit down and have a conversation with us about why this is so difficult to visualize and why it's so difficult to cover. And I keep saying photo journalists. We also spoke with video journalists as well so that we could take, so we could cover both forms of visual media. So this includes those helpful tips and the context for the creation of visual, visuals. It also talks a little bit specifically about captions. Um, we've incorporated findings here from research from Jess's research, which you'll get to hear about here in just a little bit, but they've included feedback from, once we collected that kind of initial feedback from journalists, we took it to experts through experience, experts through training, um, and journalism educators, and asked them to help us expand on this thing. So Jonathan, if you'll show the back side on the next page, at the QR code um, or at our website, reportingonaddiction.org, you can download this one page. It's one page front and back. We cheated a little bit, but one page guide that um, again can help you improve the visuals that you're either creating or the visuals that your newsroom is working. The backside looks like this. It has those kind of things that maybe we should avoid, things we should definitely avoid, uh, things we could do instead to improve our work. And why? Especially because we want to use these resources as teaching elements, that rationale becomes really important. So if you're a journalism educator, um, these are things you could pull into your classroom and not just a, hey, do this thing, but here's why we need to do this thing. I know my students, uh, Gen Z always wants an answer for why, right? They always have a why question. So we tried to help support both journalists and student journalists with those rationales. So some of the things that you're gonna see in that guide and on our website in the expanded style guide that we have for you are tips like this. Um, we wanna avoid creating these stock images, right? This is a photo that is incredibly harmful, traumatizing, and can be stigmatizing. Um, but a photo that I have published before on 100 Days in Appalachia's website. So I like to come to the table saying, I have made these mistakes before as a journalist, as an editor in a newsroom, and I am still learning and want to do better. So this is a very harmful photo, but we wanted to give an example of these are things that we should not necessarily be using. What we should do instead is think about creating images that are specific to the stories that we're telling um, and obviously avoiding that drug paraphernalia and active drug use that can be so stigmatizing and also traumatic and harmful to the people who are seeing it. Um, we have conversations within the style guide about being clear about consent. Um, we talk through what are what's the entire story that you're telling? So addiction as a disease can uh, coverage of addiction can sometimes kind of lose that context of it as a disease and a disease that is only one part of a person's life. And photos and video can really help us expand on for our audiences that this is the, just a single aspect of one human being. You can move to the next slide. Yeah, a couple other things that we'll see in the guide is um, working toward, you know, stories that actually, excuse me, visuals that hopefully show hope as well. Um, this is a photo from Meg Vogel, who was, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, who was at the Cincinnati Inquirer for a while. Um, this is not an addiction photo, but I like to use this photo as an example because we can very clearly see that based on the oxygen um, that he has some type of medical disorder that he is dealing with, and yet there is so much joy in this photo. So these are the kinds of things we're trying to push you toward. Um, his disease is one aspect of his life, but it is not all of his life. And there are still joyful and hopeful moments that he's experiencing. And then the next thing on our list is um, we also talk about making non-identifying images or video and ways that you can do that. 
This is again a Meg Vogel story that's actually from a tornado that she covered in Southern Ohio. Um, but I love the example again because we cannot see this person's face. We do not necessarily know who they are. And so their privacy is being protected. But at the same time, this is an incredibly emotional photo. And I feel a connection with this individual. So those are just a handful of things that our visual guide covers. And we're also going to talk about those things in more detail with our panel here in a few minutes. But I just want to do a quick thank yous to some of the folks who were heavily involved in the creation of this visual style guide. You'll hear from some of these folks today. Others are on the call and I've seen their names pop up. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, Everything that we do at Reporting on Addiction is informed by the people in the fields that we are trying to both assist. Uh, well, I guess we're, we're trying to assist in some way all the fields as experts through training and experts through experience are a vital part of shaping the work that we are doing and trying to improve the journalism. But we never want to make assumptions about what journalists need. So even though I work in a newsroom, even though I'm a journalism educator, we still include those voices in the conversation to make sure that we're serving journalists today. So hopefully that comes across as you take a look at the visual resource. Um, and I think we're ready, Jonathan. I think we're ready to jump into our panel. Okay, so I'm gonna do some quick introductions and then panelists, I will ask you um, to unmute and we'll jump into the chat. For the folks who are joining us on the call, you are welcome to um, drop your questions. We're gonna save some time for questions here. You're welcome to drop your questions into the chat if you prefer. Um, when we get to the point that we're taking audience questions, I also have no problem if you just wanna raise your hand so that we can ask you to unmute and you can ask the question yourself. Um, but first, let's start with introductions. So I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Martha Tilson, who is joining us from Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Tilson is a sociologist by training and a research scientist at UK's Center on Drug and Alcohol Research and Substance Use Priority Research Area. Her research centers on women's unique experiences with substance use and related risks, including a focus on factors and services that support women's recovery, particularly at community reentry post incarceration. So, Dr. Tilson, thank you for being here. Then we have Jessica Halsey, who is the founder of the Addiction Policy Forum, which is a national nonprofit that helps patients, families, and communities affected by substance use disorders. Her work comes from personal experience after losing both parents to a substance use disorder. And she's currently working on a couple of NIH grants, um, including in building the stakeholder engagement and dissemination plans for both the Justice Community Opioid Initiative, or excuse me, Innovation Network, and those HEAL initiatives that maybe a handful of people have heard of in a couple of states. Um, so thank you again, Jess, for being with us today. And then we have Jesse Wright, who is my longtime colleague, both here at WBU and formerly at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, um, an incredibly talented photojournalist, if I, I will put my opinion out there. Um, so here at WBU in the Reed College Media, Jesse teaches um, writing, broadcast, and media classes. He's also a contributing editor at 100 Days in Appalachia. Again, served as the news director at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, and but also had, comes with decades of experience as a newspaper editor, uh, a layout of newspaper layout, and an editorial photographer. Um, Jesse's going to answer a question here in just a second, and you might notice a little bit of an accent. That's because he was born and raised in South Africa and came to join us here in West Virginia in the mid ninety in the mid nineties to attend university. So, to our panelists, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I want to start with a question for everyone. Um, and you know, we we kind of mentioned this briefly earlier in the session, but I'd love to hear from each of our panelists about the importance and the lasting impact that visuals have in news stories. Kind of a two-part question here. First, for each of you from your perspectives and your areas of expertise, why do you think visuals impact people so deeply? And then in turn, why must journalists be more cautious? when they're creating visuals of vulnerable populations, specifically for journalism spaces. Jess, could I maybe ask you to go first? Sure, sure. 
Um, uh, so Jessica Holsey, thank you again for having me today. Nice to, to see everyone. Um, at Addiction Policy Forum, we've been really focused on how do we address stigma in lots of different ways. And you know, we've done a lot of talk and focus on language. Um, but um, and as you mentioned, Ashton, like if the language is great in an article, but the image is, is, is doesn't sort of reflect that this is a health condition, it's treatable, people do recover, um, we're sort of missing an opportunity to, um, to sort of con convey accurately what substance use disorder is. Uh, we put out a publication this summer, we did qualitative interviews and published a study in health and justice on the effects of imagery around substance use disorder and around criminal justice involvement. Um, and I think it's, it has such a big impact and I, I'm really proud of that paper because we let our patients and individuals with lived experience tell the story on why it has a big impact to them. And there's many reasons. One, can you convey hope? Can you convey that this is a medical condition, that it is treatable? Are we reinforcing stereotypes and prejudice? Because those two factors are what really sort of create stigma and uh, so the devaluation of our patient group. And all of that can be wrapped up in, in one image without us really realizing it. And even some of our images at APF, I had to go back in and correct some of my stories once we really had a, a very sort of deep conversation with patients. Um, uh, so I think the big impact is because a lot can be contained in one image, both in reflecting, is this a health condition? Is this something we can recover from? Um, and reinforcing anything that's sort of a negative per per perception of our entire patient group of sort of being dan dangerous or um, bringing this on ourselves to kind of that category, is this a health condition or a character flaw, a moral issue um, can, can be reinforced in an image. And then the shift to making this about um, a healthcare lens uh, can be so achievable in an image. And we included in our publication some examples and some sample images that you can use. And it really, I, I really love the resource that you all have built um, and, and uh, have made available. I, I think it really reflects a lot of what we found. And the last thing for question two, so that's a little bit about the why does it have a big, big impact? There's a lot that is, can be wrapped up into even a single image. And it really comes down to those, those sort of key messages that come through. But in terms of the second piece about why be careful, um, in, in addition to just sort of um, sort of findings of stigma or this feeling that it was judgment or, or sort of feeling that there, there was no hope or, or not a way to treat addiction. The other thing that we found in our work is um, what we call Q reactivity and substance use disorder. Uh, so if there's an active image of someone using a substance, um, if you have needles, syringes, um, uh, other sort of scenarios, it isn't that it's just triggering for, we have over 20 million in Americans in recovery. It actually um, is sort of uh, can make individuals sort of be reactive to that sort of cue for using. So to think about using again, or for that to trigger cravings and urges to use. So when we think about the effects that we can have accidentally with our image selection on all the people who either are in recovery, and even if you're in stable recovery, um, it can be difficult to see some of these images, right? Um, it can bring up feelings of shame and self-stigma. It can make you think of using again. Um, so I think we were hopeful and, and want to be partners with, um, with the media and with journalists to, to um, give you more resources and provide that why. We, we love to make sure with I and the why, that the best why comes from our patients and, and really learning from how images and words can impact those either with an active use disorder, those in treatment and recovery. Um, and there's a lot wrapped up in some of these images that could in fact be harmful to those um, who need a little bit more wrap up and support from all of us. Um, instead of risks that can come through with some of these portrayals. Martha, do you want to add here? I mean, why, from your perspective of research and, and treatment, why are these visuals so impactful and why must we then be really careful about using them? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so uh, before I dive in, I do want to share that I'm I'm really feel like I'm wearing two hats today um, because I am wearing my researcher hat as a research scientist at UK, but I am also myself a person in long term recovery from a substance use disorder. So I really study the things. Thank you. <laughs> I study the things that I study because most of them are honestly things that I have done personally, right, or things that I've lived through. So I know firsthand how important it is to shine a light on those issues and to try to find effective solutions, which I know that is exactly what journalism is trying to do as well. Um, but the fact- Right is, there with you, Martha. Right thank there you. with you. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. 
Um, so the fact is those, those stigmatizing images, I think, um, they create a mistrust, right? And I, that's a point that comes out uh, throughout the style guide that I really appreciate that you all highlighted. But, but talking about imagery that shows that negative side of addiction, because I think that that sends a message to people who use drugs or people in recovery that you want to make me look bad. You want to make me feel bad. You want to make me feel ashamed. And I know we've emphasized like this is accidental. That's not the, the desired impact, right? But I think that you want to use me as like a bad example or a cautionary tale. And I think that the mistrust that can be created by those images like that really has a way of extending to anybody outside of that community as a person who uses drugs. And and it'll impact the way that you view not just journalists, but anybody outside of your circle. Um, leads you to ask questions like, why are you here? What do you want from me? Do you pity me? Do you hate me? Are you disgusted by me or scared of me? Or do you want to help me, right? Do you want to, do you want to amplify my voice? Um, do you want to make sure that I feel seen and that I feel heard and in a way that I want to be seen or heard, right? So I think that with that trust, you have an opportunity to build walls or break down walls. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that like research, historically speaking, also has a pretty bad track record when it comes to exploitation of vulnerable populations. <laughs> Um, so this is definitely something that I am sensitive to from both perspectives, like as a researcher and as a person with lived experience. But that trust is very hard won and very easily lost. And I think that a huge component of that trust is how you choose to portray the experience of addiction. And that absolutely extends to visual media. So thank you all for the work that you're doing in this area. Well, thank you. Thank you for your help with it. Jesse, can I bring that question to you from the perspective of a photojournalist, a newsroom leader, a journalism educator. Um, we talk about why those visuals are so important. Why do we also have to be careful about them? How do you speak to your reporters or to your students about that? Yeah, and, and I will say, I'll admit as much as anybody, my, my sort of complicity pre being involved with this group in, in, in that, um, in that so much pressure comes to us. We, we understand as news professionals that, um, visuals drive everything you know we know that from the 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 pre-social media age that we talked about above the fold in single copy sales the newspaper we knew that impactful vi visuals led those sales and that transferred straight into the digital era where attention is the new economy and what grabs attention usually it's a very active headline and it's a very engaging visual and in the absence of something spectacular like a fire or a car wreck or something like that, we tend to, in our minds as editors, go down the list. What else is going to create engagement? And something that is salacious or maybe outside of you, maybe in, in an area of taboo, is going to be in that next order. And so when we show those things, they engage people. And we know that that engagement will drive our likes, our comments, our shares, that sort of thing, for better or worse. Um, and with this particular topic, I think it's for worse for all the, the, the reasons that have been explained, um, you know, from the participant perspective, the thing that we're always stuck with is that pressure to produce and that pr pressure to engage as, as journalists. So I think that's the reason why we have to resist it. We have to stop and say, are we um, creating a lifetime attachment around this issue because of these striking visuals that we're like the image that you showed in your presentation, where it's full of paraphernalia and active use, even though we don't see a face in that image, uh, so we're not connecting it to a particular individual, then all the names in that story get associated with that visual, whether they were involved with that activity or not. Um, so that becomes the connection we make. Also, what I, what I tell my students especially, um, but that we started discussing at West Virginia Public Broadcasting while I was there, I was there from 2015 to 2020. But um, what we started discussing in that sort of year before I left was the fact that these stories stick around forever. That if you end up, um, and you know, I, I use the example with my students of neonatal abstinence syndrome, which I, from what I understand that the science is far from settled around that topic. But when we report on a family that is experiencing that issue with the child, maybe through foster care or even on their own, um, and we use names, those names are going to live forever. In the same way, the visuals attached to those names and that issue are going to live forever in some format. So when that child who is maybe even under a year old gets a social
associated with that story, what happens when they go for that interview in 18 years or 20 years or 25 years where they go to, to look for a job and someone Googles their name and that story comes up. Now that image is associated with that name forever. So that's something um, that I think about and I talk about is, is essentially our responsibility to those sources, much like uh, Ob Gynes or something, you know, doctors who deliver babies, our responsibility is to them uh, to those sources last much longer than our association um, as a source for a, one particular story. Absolutely. And I want to just add quickly that when I was a reporter in your newsroom, I always appreciated having the space to talk through those ethical gray areas. Um, but not every journalist gets that opportunity. So journalists who are on this call that don't know how to bring up those conversations within their newsroom, this visual guide, the language guide, we're hoping that they can also be conversation starters for you. Jess, if we can come back to you, I want to talk a little bit more into specifics now. So in, in our guide, in the research that you put out this summer, which is linked in the chat for everyone who wants to take a look at it, please do. Um, but we talked a lot about what to avoid. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts or recommendations for journalists on this call about what they can create. What are the things they should be doing instead that honors the individual and their life experiences, whether it's a story about harm reduction, addiction, treatment, recovery, any of those things, what images or video can we use that gets us beyond the stigma and beyond the disease? Yeah. Um, so I think it, the the images that came out and were endorsed by um, patients as uh, you know appropriate to use or not even appropriate, sometimes feeling hopeful, and this these are images that they want to see in videos and in print and, and, and online are really in one the, the medical framework. One of our quotes in this study is uh, keep it scientific, keep it fact-based. Like when you are reinforcing um, that this is a health condition, you're actually partnering with us to help deconstruct stigma because so much stigma in the U.S. is based on this misinformation and myth that this is not a health condition or this lack of education, that this is a character or moral issue. So instead of, 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 uh, uh, of thinking of this as sort of a deficit or um, um, you know, being critical or blaming or shaming patients, it's sort of really reinforcing and almost uh, joining the team with us on helping us to deconstruct some misinformation that that really contributes to, to stigma and, and problems accessing care for so many patients. So anything that's in a healthcare lens or in a treatment lens, um, things that are showing sort of positive activities in a support group, um, if it's a setting or um, a mobile van or a harm reduction or a syringe service program or a, a you know MOUD and MAT program, and the with the individual's face out of frame um, or or looking out, uh, sort of that hopeful um, services focused imagery um, got positive endorsements. Um, doing well connections with family. Um, I do agree. Um, uh, just to sort of reiterate Jesse's points, thinking through is. If this is this uh, appropriate to put someone's face or name in a story to make sure that we do no harm and that we are protecting those that are vulnerable. Um, if someone works in the field, that's usually an indicator that this is going to be a little bit more appropriate to name them, that they won't have to have the same sort of employment uh, kickback that others can can feel. And sometimes we don't think it through because, you know, having a journalist reach out to you feels great and exciting and you want to have your work in the field or your work as a patient to be um, recognized and you you it, it feels wonderful. The comments online are not always great. And sometimes if we're new in recovery, we don't have the coping skills and the, the mechanics to address some of the, or handle some of the negative side effects of being involved in some of these things publicly. So I, I, I agree to sort of think through the readiness of people to be named and acknowledged um, and to be depicted visually in the stories, but the images can be great. We like hold hand, uh, holding hands, uh, uh, program uh, pictures of, of, of being uh, participants in programs to being in healthcare settings. 
uh, to be good moms, good dads, good workers, right? So you're showing me that I am working at my job and contributing and in control of my life because that's what recovery is is living a self-directed life again, um, that you show me, um, I, I lost my parents to opioid use disorder, but uh, you know, when my mom had a, a, a some time in recovery before I, I lost her to ad addiction related long-term side effects, but to show her connected with her family again, after, you know, losing um, custody of her children, those are the hopeful images that really debunk myths and stigma and show us as um, fully participating in our community and our families in a healthy way. Um, some of the, the bigger images can get tricky, but anything that comes through that health lens, and we have examples of not just what not to use, but examples of what to use. Um, uh, that I, I do, so I do think that there's there's plenty of options that are there um, and are actually going to kind of reaffirm that we can um, we can find help for this illness. Thank you. I want to remind folks on the call that we are welcoming questions from you all if you want to drop them in the chat or if you want to use that kind of hand raise function or whatever it is, I'll keep track of those while I ask Dr. Tilson one more question. And that is, you know, we're, we just came from this hopeful message that Jessica gave. So I apologize that this is a little bit going back toward the negative, but one of our recommendations is to never use an image of or use video of a person who is overdosing. Um, and, and for some reason, we got a lot of pushback for that from photojournalists in particular who, and I, I don't know that, I don't want to discount their argument, but they see those images in that video as being something that can push for change within a community. So our basic reasoning at the most basic level is that they can't give you permission to have their photo taken or video taken of them in that situation. And so we should think twice about it. But I'm wondering if Dr. Tilson, you can add to that conversation. Why should we not be creating visuals in those instances and sharing them with the public? 100%. I'm, I'm so glad that y'all are asking this question. I think this is so important. Um, so I've survived a couple of overdoses, um, but that's not all that I've done, right? Um, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a dog mom, I knit and I hike and I ride my bike. I have two bachelor's degrees and a master's and a PhD and like pretty respectable history of publications and presentations in my fields. Um, but I think this is kind of going to what Jessica and Jesse have already been saying. If you were to see an image or a video of me experiencing an overdose, I am pretty positive that that is what your mind would go to if you saw me on the streets. That is who you would think I was. Um, and I, that's who I would think that I was, honestly, because like Jesse mentioned, that image is going to live out there in the world forever in perpetuity. And I think that using imagery of people experiencing overdoses, it shrinks them down into one moment, one really horrible, horrible brink of death moment. And then it puts that moment out there in the world forever. And it hurts, it hurts families. I'm really glad that this has come up in discussion as well. I mean, think of how it would feel to see a news story about your parent with a photo of your parent experiencing an overdose or your sibling or your child. Um, but then also for the individual, it labels that person, it shames them. And like we've been saying, we live in a digital age now where that shame can follow them for literally the rest of their lives. So, so if we're trying to stem the, the rising tide of overdoses, which I think everybody in this room can agree is something that needs to happen. I think that one of the most powerful things that we can do if we want to affect that change, right, Ashton, is to, instead of shrinking the person into that one moment, to actually zoom back out, right? Who, who was this person before they experienced an overdose? Um, if they survived, what did they go on to do afterwards? Why should we care, right? If we want to push for change, I think one of the most powerful things that we can do is we can make the point that people who have overdoses are worth saving. They're more than just that one horrible moment in their life. And we all know that dead people can't recover. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Jesse, I have another question for you, but I want to hold space for Ben. So Ben, do you want to unmute and ask your question? And then maybe I can come back to mine. Sure. So um, 
an instance or an idea that I had in my head, a potential idea or a potential scenario uh, is if a photojournalist is following somebody, maybe taking a day in a life or something, and somebody invites them into a recovery space, like an AA meeting or something like that, how should the photojournalist act when it comes to that and res be able to respect the space and respect people's um, first anonymity uh, and, 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 their, um, and also their agency within that space? Absolutely. Does anyone have a response for Ben? I mean, I, I can talk a little bit just about, you know, from a journalist perspective, if I, if I was in that situation. And, and again, it's, you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about, I think, today is, goes back to that idea of what consent is. I think a lot of journalists, photojournalists or otherwise, we, we stop at what, it, what our requirements are under the law or, you know, in a particular space. We will say, well, this is allowed, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do what the rules allow me to do versus what is the correct thing or what is the right thing from a storytelling perspective to do? How does this um, uh, encounter uh, affect my relationship and my organization's relationship with, with the community? And those recovery spaces are part of the communities that we live in. Um, so what does that do for our ongoing relationship with folks? So I think it goes beyond just thinking about what, what do we need to do in terms of getting consent in those moments for visuals, for, for being uh, allowed. And it really is a privilege to join those spaces. Um, I have a phrase that I use with, with my with my students, my more advanced students, which is nobody owes you a goddamn thing. And <laughs> um, and there's a couple exceptions to that, but I won't go, though, go into those now. But we often act as journalists with a little bit of ego in that, that we feel entitled and we feel entitled to be in those spaces. So asking for consent, I think talking things through, Talking things through, not from just the perspective of what we're doing, but what the output is likely to be, how these images and how the story may show up in spaces um, outside of our journalism. What are the, what are the, you know, it doesn't take long to have those conversations to get people on board and to fully explain what, what we're doing. I think often as journalists, we don't feel like we have to explain what we're doing or why. We're here to cover a story and that's all you need to know. And I think we need to change that thinking for all the all of the stories that 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 we cover, not just this space. So again, when I when I talk to my students, especially about this, let's apply all the rules that we that we learn in journalism to this to this particular space or or, or this particular um, encounter. Um, why do we stop uh, applying the rules that we would have around? other vulnerable populations when it comes to addiction. And I think it's often for those reasons that that sort of have been explained here, which is, you know, um, that we need to get the story out. We need to we need to to, to push for that deadline um, and that we need to get this um, image of maybe active addiction or a, an overdose out to sort of shock people in some way into paying attention to this issue. Um, but I don't think that that's correct. Yeah, I think there's also some wonderful tips happening in the chat that are very similar to the things we put in the resource. So I really love that. Jessica, I know you had started to unmute. Did you want to add to that question from Ben about how journalists should be acting in those spaces, especially in those AA, NA kind of spaces they might be invited into? Yeah, um, I, well, I love some of the, I do love the tips, Kylie's tip about hands and anything that sort of is showing activity or engagement, but keeping that person's um, uh, sort of identity anonymous, I think is really helpful. I I, I wish as someone, I, this is my 31st year in this field. I started as, as, a, as a teenager, actually. So I've been doing this a long time. I wish that we were in a space where there wasn't so much stigma and judgment and actual discrimination for our patients. But we're not there yet, right? So we still need to, I think, be thinking through and being really um, deliberate about keeping people um, safe and making sure um, that we're asking even some questions on their behalf, right? If they're not, sometimes we, we, especially if we're newly in recovery, maybe we're not fully playing our tape forward. So we're not thinking, is this going to get in the way of the job that I want to get seven years from now? Or is this going to show up? 
and I have not disclosed, right? Because disclosure can be very difficult. Um, I have not disclosed to my employer, to my partner, to my partner's parents, to my colleagues, to these folks, the folks at church. So just a, a little bit of a moment and to, to reflect on sort of our ethical responsibilities to some of the most vulnerable patients that need care right now, I, I think in the US. Uh, so I think that pause point is important. Um, and the other piece, and I, I know I've said this once before, but also thinking through, like we love, like, you know, you, it's like a nice little dopamine um, push that you're getting attention and you feel like you've done something helpful and you're, you know, participating and raising awareness or education about recovery services or harm reduction or SUD, but you haven't thought through any of the backlash that comes with this, right? And social media and website comments can be very, as you all know, um, they're not really sometimes happy places. Um, and those can be, very, I can't tell you how many sessions we've had with peer recovery coaches helping those who've disclosed in different ways their uh, recovery status and not really been prepared for some of the, the backlash or feedback that comes through. So just a, one cautionary tale. And then back to Ben's question, um, I think sort of making sure you disclose and are really um, intentional about getting consent um, and protecting people's anonymity um, and sort of learning from them, um, but really making sure that you are a bit of a fly on the wall and, and know that um, questions can come afterwards. These are uh, such important spaces where you can feel safe. And if you get invited in, those sort of two prong pieces of making sure everyone in the room knows that what your role is um, and making sure that um, uh, everyone's comfortable with their level of involvement in your story and then follow up conversations outside of that setting, when, which is really therapeutic, some of the recommendations that we pass on to people. I want to make sure we take the questions in order. So I'm going to jump to Ashley's in the chat. And Jesse, I think this is maybe best for you. I think we're looking for a journalist perspective. Um, I'm going to skip straight to the question. Uh, I wonder if journalists would be able to mention somehow that they were intentional about the photo they chose. In our guide, we definitely talk about having those conversations within the newsroom and with your editors and with people who are doing layout and all of that stuff. Is there a way that we can communicate with our audience that we have been intentional in these choices? Do you have a perspective on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, look, a, a, lot, a lot of what I've been looking at here in the last couple of years is really about that journalism being more should be more of a two way street than it's been. So we, we, we have the ability to flow information both ways, but and yet, yet we often pretend that that ability doesn't exist in some ways. So, um, you know, I think taking advantage of that, I, I, you know, I used to be quite anti broadcast before I went into broadcasting as a newspaper guy. But um, I think that's one of the ways that that things have changed is, is that all journalists are journalists in all mediums at this point. There's no job out there. It's what I caution my students. You're not going to go and just work in print or just work in visuals. It's often going to combine, and especially the rise of podcasts. So what I would say is that it's it's fine to to have a mission statement to, especially if you're going to do a project, a special project around something like addiction, which is often how that coverage shows up. Um, I, I'm glad to see that it's become a longer term project for a lot of newsrooms as opposed to just reactionary to, to what's happening on a particular day in a community, which is, I think, a positive development. But that can also that can be long term harm as well. So we've got to carefully think about how that goes along. So, um, you know, I, I did some coaching this uh, summer with a couple of newsrooms who are going through a community engagement uh, initiatives. And one of those uh, aspects of, of good community engagement is informing your audience about what you're doing and why, and allowing for an exchange of ideas, either through an opinion page or maybe a special section on your website where you take that feedback um, and you respond to it instead of just saying, well, we don't owe anybody any response. I think we do. We, we, we've got to stop treating journalism as an extractive industry and start thinking about how we can return things back to the community. And I think the least of that is, is stating our intentions and our motivation extremely care carefully and clearly. It's not comfortable for a lot of print journalists to do that. I think broadcasters are more, um, especially public media broadcasters are a little bit more um, uh, uh, used to doing that. But um, I, th I think making that that side public is not only, you know, um, uh, a good idea in terms of community engagement and holding an audience and building an audience, but I think it's vital just in terms of our moral imperative 
um, and, and covering our entire community. Just tell folks why you're doing the thing that you're doing. Yeah, and becomes a trust building exercise as well, right? Becomes this, back to what Martha's saying earlier, becomes part of the process of building trust with our audiences. Um, I know that Mitzi had a hand raised and I don't know if it just timed out or, or if you're not interested in sharing or having a question anymore. Okay, there, there we are. Do you wanna unmute? Yes, yeah, so I just, my name is Mitzi Averett. I am a nursing faculty uh, in academia and I finally ended up in a situation at work at a university where I got a HRSA grant to teach uh, uh, best practice and better understanding about substance use disorder to healthcare professional students, graduate students, undergraduate students, and to the community because it is so misunderstood. I've been sober for 41 years, and that fact tells you kind of that I had to get sober in 12 step on one level because it really was all there was. And there's a lot of confusion in my, in my opinion in 12 step about the tradition of anonymity. Um, Bill Wilson himself testified before Congress and talked about recovery advocacy and the importance of that and those types of things. But it is a very individual and decision and the timing of it. And I just so agree with what Jessica was saying. Young people often who are so grown up, who have grown up in such a different time than me, you know, I'm, I can't be 41 years sober without being old, you know, so I'm in my sixties and, um, uh, it would, there were times in my career as a healthcare professional that I would have, that I feel that it would have been very dangerous. And um, I actually know a medical student who killed herself because she couldn't get an internship because it was discovered that she had had like a juvenile arrest, you know, for um, like vandalism or whatever it was, you know, and drunk and all that stuff. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm just here to say that there's a lot of things that, that as a, as a nurse for this amount of time, the, the phrase first do no harm keeps coming into my brain. And, and I got to tell you, there are a lot of healthcare professional organizations and groups that do not understand that. Uh, and, and especially because there are so many pathways right now that work so much better for different people at different times. And so, yeah, 12 step has, has, does have some, you know, information out there about to journalists, right? But there are also other pathways that really encourage recover out loud when you can, when it's safe, for you to do so, recover out loud so that others don't die in silence Absolutely. because there are too many people dying that have no hope. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Mitzi. I really appreciate you sharing with us. Um, I, we have Sean had a question in the chat that's going to, he said it would be willing to unmute and share with us. Sean, can I ask you to go next? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ashton. And Mitzi, I can really relate. I'm a physician in recovery. Um, and I do a lot of related work and it's really challenging, you know, that culture of silence um, for healthcare professionals. But I, I did write this question that in the chat and, you know, considering how, you know, negative, you know, our perceptions are societal perceptions towards drugs and drug use and, um, and overdose, is it ever ethical to get consent um, from an individual? I mean, we have no idea you know, what the consequences will be down the road. Um, and, you know, we, we just, we can't predict it. And, and they themselves, the individual may not know, you know, where their life will go and what impact it may have. So um, can we ever do this? Should we ever do this? Especially if we want to change culture around drugs and drug use and overdose, right? And be part of the solution. Absolutely. Panel, do we have... Have any thoughts to share with Sean? 
So just to, to jump in, um, um, one thank, thank you, Mitzi, for sharing. Thank you uh, for the great thoughtful question, Sean. It's a good question. It's a question that keeps me up at night too. Um, I, I, th I think in more situations than not, um, I would probably always uh, veer towards um, the images of the hands or someone in a photo from behind looking out onto the program, their home, their their work, their job, their family, um, and try to protect that an um, anonymity and not disclose, because I don't think um, we do a good job of understanding the long-term consequences of disclosure. Um, I have a couple examples uh, just to, but the, there are more examples that uh, I think give us pause and it's uh, maybe reasons for reflection over whether, whether when, when and if someone is um, safe enough, if it's that we're not going to affect their livelihood, uh, their mental health, their substance use disorder, their recovery status, their family, their housing situation. There's just so many um, sort of uh, downstream consequences when we don't think through um, uh, our disclosure. If you work in the field, um, if 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 there are uh, activities or projects you've already taken on, right? I can talk about my family's experience. I work in this field. I run APF. Um, I my uh, other folks who um, are more public facing and disclose that they're in recovery from from different substance use disorders. Um, more likely to look to work in the field if we include them in anything that's public facing. Two examples, though, um, on one, there was uh, one, you know, amazing recovery program, um, lots of young, young adults that were involved, lots of excitement, uh, trips to the White House, uh, front page newspapers about the work they were doing. And, and about seven, eight years later, we lost half of those young adults to overdose fatalities, right? Lots of um, backlash, lots of things that we sort of hadn't haven't hadn't played that tape forward on what having this information out in the open in my community, which is not does not see yet addiction as a health condition. It does not um, sort of they, it's very clearly still sees this as a character issue um, and that we can't recover from it. So I don't I don't think that we uh, obviously didn't do that intentionally, but the, the unintentional consequences keep me up at night. And this is not just for patients. We have this project called Stop Overdose, and we really um, tell the stories of families who've lost a loved one to an overdose, overdose fatality. But I think both Ashley and Jonathan mentioned this in the chat. There are also sort of inter intersectionalities of um, sort of bias, stigma, discrimination, and the treatment that our families receive um, based on if they are a white family who lost a loved one versus a black or Latinx family who lost a loved one. I have to have staff stay up overnight to man uh, nastiness on Twitter because the same community that follows um, the, this, this website and this campaign responds very differently based on race and ethnicity. So that's intersectionality of sort of the stigma around addiction hitting some racism pieces head on um, so I, I think it, it it is our responsibility to think through, are we doing no harm? Um, are we leaving people, if not better than we found them, are we leaving them without um, additional injuries on top of a really complicated chronic health condition to manage? Uh, so I would always err towards or lean towards um, um, keeping people out of frame and being really careful about using real names until you know, and, and, and maybe even had some prompting questions. Have you talked this through with your counselor, therapist, psychologist, psych psychiatrist, your sponsor, your support group network? Um, do you feel that you're in a place where you're ready to have the disclosure of your chronic health condition um, out among your family, your friends, your church, your employer, your um, sort of social network? Um, if there is negative feedback that you receive in the comment section or in social media that feels very um, stigmatizing or judgmental of people with substance use disorders, can we talk through how you will handle that? What does your support system look like? What does your access to resources look like? We ask these questions anytime we engage patients in anything that is forward facing or is going to be public. Um, and I, I think some of those same rules or processes for journalists, um, I, I think would be wonderful to see. Yeah, absolutely. I think I want to add a little bit because um, while I do not disagree with anything that Jessica said, and we have as journalists 
a much larger responsibility to ask those kinds of questions that she just listed when telling these stories. I also don't want us as a group to walk away from this conversation um, thinking, oh, I'm going to say, I'm going to ask those things of a journalist and they're going to be like, yeah, sure, fine. I don't ever need to use faces in my stories again. I don't ever, I will always protect their and right? We as journalists need to step up to the plate and be more responsible in the use of and the permission of, and also explaining the consequences of those things. But at the same time, we have to have realistic expectations about what they are willing to do. Um, and so, Jesse, I was wondering if you would you would add to that. I don't again, I'm not I don't disagree with anything Jessica is saying. I wish we would do those things. But I also know that a photojournalist or a journalist who has to present video, it's difficult for them to say, sure, I can protect you and not share your face in this story. Their editor most of the time is not going to let that fly. Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of, it comes to trust between that editor journalist relationship. I mean, um, I think you have control over what you shoot and what ends up being edited. So that's one dynamic that you, it's some power that you have as a journalist versus that editor who demands certain visuals. I, I would just reinforce, I think it is possible to get informed consent in, in the ways that Jessica talked about. I, I think that there are people who are willing to share the stories who do understand the consequences of of disclosure, um, uh, as long as you talk those through. But I would also say that if you are in a position where you're being asked to share, say, a visual or an experience of an overdose, um, what else? You know, we talked a little bit about uh, other panelists have sort of described the fullness and not shrinking people down. What can we do as journalists to show the rest of that human being? Yes, we need to show this part. We, we feel like we have to cover this crisis in the community. If, you know, I think about that day back a couple of years ago when Huntington experienced the highest number of overdose deaths in one day than any other community had uh, experienced in, 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 in the country. Um, we have to cover that because it's a crisis in our community but if we're going to focus on it on an individual you know i heard a great interview with with a former policeman who said after 25 years on on the force what he realized is that he saw people only at their worst only ever at their worst and i think as um and so that affected his perception of who people are especially as in, in certain areas of his community and it made him jaded and only see that through that 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 10 or 15 minutes that he experienced those people when they were experiencing the worst moment of their lives. So we, in, as journalists, especially breaking news journalists, we often are in that same position where we only see this tiny slice of someone. How can we get to the rest of that human being? How can we tell a more full story that includes this experience, but also all the other experiences, the ways that they do contribute to their community, the ways that they are a, a good partner, a good parent, um, or, or even not even, you know, resisting that I that that urge to pedestal people and say, well, you've never, um, you know, backslid in your recovery, so you are the ideal human uh, who has experienced addiction. Let's see all the nuance. We, we're supposed to be good storytellers. Let's tell the entire story and not just this one moment. Absolutely. So I know we are hitting our time and I want to thank everyone for being with us today. I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but if you have additional questions, please send them to us. You can track us down at reportingonaddiction.org and we'd be happy to share those with the panelists and get you answers to the things that you need. Again, one more reminder that our new visual guide is available for you. Uh, if you're a journalist, it's available for you to begin using on our website, reportingonaddiction.org. If you are a person who works with journalists, please share those things out with them. Um, I promise that journalists want to do better work. We really do, uh, but we sometimes need your help to do it. And then again, uh, Kristen just dropped into the chat the link to sign up for our website, where we will be sharing out the recording of this event if you wanna refer back to it. Um, and also all of those resources that we have shared with you lately and a way to keep in touch. So again, Thank you everyone for being with us today. Thank you to our panel and we hope to talk to you all again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.